Carl's trying to get back to Japan and Japan has just declared a state of an emergency because of some more coronavirus cases and so um, we don't know he doesn't know when he's going to be able to go back so keep him in your prayers as well as he struggles to raise funds but even if he had the funds to go back right now we don't know when that's going to happen but I did have a chance to talk to Jan Turner uh, Jan Turner uh, works with, with Wycliffe uh, Ministries in translating Bibles and translating languages in, uh, so they, be, they can have Bibles in their languages. I can't get that out. My stammering, lisping tongue. I like that song, There's a Fountain Filled with Blood. And uh, anyway, she uh, had a small biopsy done. She had something removed and it, it was benign, so she's good. Everything's good. She's in Mexico and she's happy and she's living a lot cooler than we are. Uh, when we talked to her last, uh, last Wednesday night, it was 65 degrees outside. Uh, anyway, I'm just praying that this humidity will just kind of, if it's going to stay high, let's bring the temperature down. That's all I ask. But anyway, are you ready to hear what God has to say to you today? We're, we've been talking about clear thinking and, 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 and getting some clear thinking in our situations and in our lives. We talked about having clear thinking about our problems that we have. Anybody here have problems? If you don't have any problems, come see me. I'll give you some. I'll be happy to, to give you some. Um, I'll give you mine. Uh, clear thinking about the gospel ministry, the, the gospel that God has given us, and have clear understanding about that. We talked about having a clear understanding, a clear thinking uh, about godly manhood at Father's Day, and then last week about our own Independence Day and thinking clearly about how God can use us. This morning, I want us to, <laughs> I want us to think, uh, have clear thinking about stress. Stress. Stress is a major killer in our lives. And um, I just have to tell you, this was not a good week for me initially. I had no idea where God was directing me this particular week. I, I was staying in Tucson. I didn't have any baseball games to umpire until Friday. Uh, I was going to sleep in my own bed and, and uh, maybe even see my grandkids a little bit. And uh, God changed all of that. And I didn't know, have a clue why. Come Wednesday, the computer that I was working on crashed. I mean, I did a, they wanted me to do an update. I updated it, and it never came back on. And so in the meantime, I'm up, and I hadn't, had mu hadn't selected music yet. I hadn't started work on my message, or I had started work on it, but I hadn't really... Uh, started work on it, if you know what I mean. And, and then when I did get it up and going, I didn't have anything. I didn't have my applications, my programs. I didn't, I've lost all of my email contacts, church membership stuff in my, off of my computer. And I'm going to have to, you know, try to rebuild that. And all kinds of stress. And on, on top of that, some good news. A uh, lady from Next door in the apartment complex, you know, via Scott, was you know Scott McLeod gave it, gave her our name, and, and she came in for an interview, and we've talked to her at least twice, and we're going to ask her to fill. We've asked her to fill out some paperwork. We're going to do a background check, and if all goes well, her probationary period will start on July 19th to be our assistant, our ministry assistant here at our church. Her name is Corinne Davis, and. Um, uh, you know, there's some there's, there's some things we got to uh, get to finalized, but I just thought you'd know, and the office hours are changing, but that was going on during this week. Stress. Stress. I've done four baseball games in a row before, no problem. About the fourth inning of the third game, I started feeling kind of funky. I don't know how to say this. I never felt that, like this before. Um, in the, it, we had one out in the bottom of the fourth inning. I got behind the batter, and I thought, you know, if, if I don't step back and, and just take a breath, I will probably just hit the ground. You know, things were just, I just wasn't focusing, so I called time. I leaned up against the, 
fence. And uh, I was done for the day. I was done. I had Gina come and pick me up. Uh, stress. It's interesting how things, and then all I could think of is, what do I have left to do for Sunday morning? You know, any of you have weeks like that? What do you do about it? Stress uh, is, is really a killer. And, and I've discovered stress is not caused by people. Well, it may be internal with the individual, but it's usually caused because of circumstances in our lives. Now, we may have caused those circumstances, right? Right? Do you, do you discuss, have you discovered you have stress because of something you did? Some sort of circumstances in your life? Yeah, I think we all have. Uh, there, and also, stress is caused by how we respond to those circumstances. How well do you handle circumstances that come up? And I have to tell you, around Thursday, I, was my, I got up early to come down to the church on Thursday to try to work on this computer. And Gina says, are you going to pray over it? I says, no, I'm going to lay hands on it. <laughs> and it's going to go right out my window if I can't get it going. <clears throat> um, but it's a, it's a combination of emotions, worry, guilt, fear, bitterness, anger, tension, anxiety. Anybody have any of those things in, in your life? Let's take a look at 2 Timothy. Open your Bibles, turn them on, wherever you, whatever you have to do. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to look at three, uh, uh, basically three short verses here this morning. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Let's just stop right there. A time is coming, Paul says, when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Are we living in that day today? Very much so. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not even talking about our political circus that's going on. I'm just talking about just strange stuff happening, right? It just tells me that Jesus' return is, is near and imminent. But let's keep reading. They will follow, listen to this, they will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. I sometimes wonder if our size, if I would just change my preaching just a little bit to tell people what they want to hear rather than what they should hear. We may have more people, but I really think we need to hear what God has to say in our lives, don't you? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And um, there are some things you just need to count on. And there's a song, an old, old song, and I forget who sang it, called This Lighthouse. You know, a lighthouse does not move. A lighthouse is stationary. I told you, the, I think I told you this story, right? A ship captain saw this light in the distance, and he sent out a radio message saying, you know, I'm headed this direction, this is my, this is my heading, and you need to give way. And the response came back, uh, no, you'll need to give way. And the lights, the two lights are getting closer, and finally the ship captain says, you need to give way. I'm a United States destroyer, or no, a United States battleship, and I'll just flatten you. Or this is Captain so-and-so of the, United, the U.S. naval ship, uh, battleship, such and such. And if, if you don't turn your course, Something bad's going to happen. And, on, and the response came, this is, this is uh, seaman so-and-so, and I tend the lighthouse. I suggest you change your course. You know? And, and isn't it nice that we have some, that Jesus is a rock of our lives, that God is stable in all that he does, and he gives us those things that, that guide us and direct us, and yet at the same time, 
He transcends time, he transcends culture, he transcends political outlooks, he transcends it all, he is dynamic, and what is relevant back in the first century is still relevant today in the 21st century. And yet people want to follow their own desires and look for teachers to tell them whatever they, their itching ear wants, wants to hear. So verse 4, they will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you, that's us, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. I think I, under, I, think I underlined that phrase in your bulletin, in your outline. Keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. So how do I lower my stress level? What are the circumstances that create stress? One of those circumstances is, is, um, is being in compromising situations. Compromising situations. That creates stress in our lives. And you probably all have had times like this when you're pressured to do something that you know you shouldn't be doing, you don't want to do, or you shouldn't be doing. And the Bible says that when you're in a compromising situation in life, there are only two things that will reduce your stress over the long haul. What do you do when you're facing a compromising situation? And, and, and there's, there's all kinds of things I can tell you to do. There's all kinds of things in the Bible. I just picked out two. And, and, and prayer is always a good thing to do. In fact, uh, we are told to pray constantly. And he, the reason I didn't put prayer in there is because it's like breathing. It's like breathing. You, you just don't think about it. You just do it, right? It's Friday, Friday afternoon, about 2.30 in the afternoon, I'm thinking, keep breathing, keep breathing. You know, and, and my, my point being is we just do it, right? We should be in prayer constantly. So here's what I've done. If, I, if I'm in prayer constantly and, and I want to reduce stress in my life, do the right thing. Do the right thing. When you're in a compromising situation, do the right thing. Doing the right thing is always less stressful than doing the wrong thing. Think it through. Clear thinking. Doing, now I didn't say it was always the easiest thing to do, right? The right thing is hard, it's usually harder to do. But when you do the right thing, think about it. it doesn't it just lower your stress level just a bit? Because you're doing the right thing. I have been, I have been, I've been, I've had various careers. I actually, I've only had two careers. I had, uh, I was an air traffic controller. And um, what's interesting is, and John can tell you this, I, I, can, I can direct air traffic all I want to, but John, who's ultimately in charge of the flying of the aircraft? The captain of the aircraft. So if he does, you know, I can still do the right thing, and, uh, and the, if the cabin decides he didn't want to do that, that's okay. I'll find something else for him to do. Um, or go, or land someplace else. Anyway, my point is, doing the right thing just lowers your stress level. It just, it just brings it down. Um, but it's not easy. The easiest thing for us to do is to compromise our convictions. That's the, that's the easy thing to do. Now, does anybody want to testify that they've kind of fallen into that trap a couple of times in their lives? I'll raise my hand, all right? And it always created more stress than I wanted to deal with. So then you're either carrying, you're either carrying guilt or fear if you compromise your conviction, guilt or fear. And you know what? You're going to be found out. You're going to be found out. I want you to take a look at what the Bible says. In Proverbs 9, uh, 10, verse 9, People with integrity walk safely. They have firm footing. Those who follow crooked paths will be exposed. Crooked paths will be exposed. Circle the word will. 
what it's saying there is if you don't want to slip and fall maintain your integrity because you will slip and fall you will be found out few things destroy integrity faster than let's say greed we, we just want so much thing so many things and then you know God says I will I will take care of your needs but God does not want to take care of your greeds you know and it's so easy for us to fall prey to our greeds and I'm not just talking about money we're going to talk about this in just a little bit when we're talking about competing but when we're in competing situations but we we want what somebody else has you know we have we want we want a better life we want a better whatever you know maybe a better spouse whatever it is no sorry you're stuck with me my wife is stuck with me she made a promise and so did I people tend to throw out their values and integrities and everything else to get more what is more important in my life truth or things what's more important in your life the truth well wait a minute let's let, let's look at the options if truth is more important then when you, when you come to a compromising situation you'll do the right thing if things are more important you'll give up the truth and you'll lie about it in order to get more things now process that we're talking about clear thinking having integrity is not always an easy thing to do particularly when the people around you lack it to begin with they are they are seeking after their own desires right so one of the major contributors to stress being in, in, in compromising situation is we need to learn to do the right thing we do the right thing it lowers our stress level then also it, it, it's a matter of trust we need to trust God with the future we need to trust God with the future because we're the, the reality is if you're honest with yourself today isn't too today is really very important okay but follow my thinking here don't take this out of context when we have anxiety we're not worried about today what are we worried about say tomorrow right well if I trust God with the future and I'm doing the right thing guess what my entire stress level just decreases it just drops I want you to take a look at Proverbs 23 verses 17 and 18 in your bulletin and don't envy sinners but always continue to fear the uh, to fear the Lord you will be rewarded for this your hope will be will not be disappointed God tells us not to envy people who are dishonest not to envy people who have lack of integrity I can't tell you how many times good Christian people look up to people that have no no integrity they 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 just they claim to have integrity but they just don't have it we might see them prospering but you know what judgment hasn't come yet and the Bible says people who are like this don't have much of a future on the other hand you will not be disappointed in your future if you have integrity think about it I mean it's just not only is it spiritually correct it just makes sense if I'm if, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing doing the right thing with integrity I don't have to worry about the future it's still the right thing and I don't care how upside down the world is folks listen the right thing is still the right thing and God is going to protect your future there's an Old Testament prophet by the name of Isaiah you know Isaiah he was a prophet for God and poor Isaiah <laughs> he was prophesizing in one kingdom about us the, the the other kingdom he, he was he was a, he was northern kingdom but prophesizing to the southern kingdom of Judah 
For so, so first of all, he wasn't well liked to begin with. And then what he had to say wasn't appealing to what people wanted to hear. And God says, you need to do this, and you need to say this. And there was things he, want, he didn't want to say, and there was things he didn't want to do. Sound familiar? God has called us. Go, therefore, and what? Make disciples. There are things we've been called to do. There are things we want to do. Uh, there, there are things God wants us to do. There are things God wants us to say. And they're not easy to say. But he had to do it anyway because of the right thing. And listen to what he says in Isaiah 49, 4. I leave it all in the Lord's hands. I will trust God for my reward. Can you say that this morning? Can you say you will trust God for your reward? Listen, understand that if you stand for anything in this world, you're going to be criticized. Take a stand for something and see where the criticism comes from. Hey, umpire a baseball game and make a decision. Pretty soon somebody's going to be arguing that with, with that decision you just made. You took a stand. He's out. No, he's not. He's safe. I saw it through the chain link fence. And I'm sitting, there, I'm sitting there trying to cool off the other day, you know, it's Friday, and there's two chain link fence, and there was a close play that was, you know, that, that was going on at the time. And the, I thought the umpire got it right, but some of the people around me didn't. And I says, man, you're right. This chain link fence really gives you a much better view of what goes out on the field. And they just looked at me and started laughing. But see, sometimes we look at life through a chain link fence. And sometimes you, there's two chain link fences. There's a gate and there's a fence. And as your eyes move, you've got this, this stuttering thing going on. But boy, you may be 200 feet away, but you certainly have a much better view than the person standing about five feet away who's listening and watching the play. And, and, and yet... We need to understand that whenever you, I'm, I'm going to be criticized for taking a stand for Christ. I, Jesus is the Lord of my life. I love him. He saved my soul. He's forgiven my, he has forgiven me my sins and he continues to do so. <coughs> he promised to give me an abundant life, which he's, he's doing. And I have hope for tomorrow. And guess what? I'm going to be criticized for that. And you're going to be criticized for that. And let me tell you what, you take the other position, you take the other side, and you're going to be criticized for that too. So if I'm going to be criticized for anything, I want to be criticized for taking a stand for God. Because I know, I know what He's capable of doing. And I know what he's, he, he wants to do. And we were talking about this on Wednesday night. He has extended grace to us. He's like, we're, we're earthbound, aren't we? Isn't that what we talked about Wednesday night? Those of you who joined us on our Zoom meeting, we're earthbound. But God isn't. God transcends that, and he reaches down with his hands of grace, and it takes us with our, arm, our hand of faith to reach out to grab it. And then God won't let go. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> you can lower your stress level in compromising situations by doing the right thing and trust God for the future. But then we have other situations, like conflicting situations. Anybody ever dealt with conflict in their life? Is that a laugh? Is that laughter uh, like, yeah? <laughs> right? Conflicting. Doesn't con... If you, are, if you are constantly living in a conf, in, in conflict situation, you have no stress, you are the one probably causing the conflict. Just, just, you just might want to look in the mirror. God made every one of us different. Every one of us are wired differently. And because of that, because we're wired differently, because each of us are different, guess what? We're going to have conflicts. We're going to have conflicts. Do you think my, I have the same upbringing as my wife had when we met? She was 18 
Actually, she was 12. I'm sorry. That would be wrong, wouldn't it? My point being is she had, she had an upbringing with her parents. I had a different upbringing with my parents. I had two families, two moms, two dads. I'm sorry, I had a mother and father and a mother and a father. I just want to clarify in this day, this day and age. I had two sets of parents that I was trying to be pleasing. I had two different families that I, I belonged to. And uh, she had one. You think there wasn't some conflict that we had to resolve in, in our relationship over the last 40 years? And are we and maybe still dealing with? God wires you differently. Aren't you? Look around. There's not one of us that are alike. Isn't that great? What's wrong with being different? And yet being the same. Follow my thinking. If you have Jesus Christ in your life, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We have one faith, one baptism, one God, one spirit. We have one mission. Isn't that great? We each know what our marching orders are. And yet, in, in our diversity is where our strength lies because now we get to go out and do all these things together. And yet we have these different ex experiences and different learning things, different... Uh, God made us different. Look at, just look at our shape. You know, some shapes are round. I'm in shape. Round's a shape, right? Some of you have these washboards, well, maybe not in this room, guts. Uh, I, I don't know. I, don't, I think all those muscles kind of look kind of tacky, you know? So that's why I like the nice, smooth, round look. We're made different. What's wrong with that? So what do we do when we have these, these, these conflicts? First of all, we need to change our focus. I got to change my focus. I need to change my focus when I'm in conflict. And that's hard. When you're face to face with somebody and you're in conflict, you need to change your focus. We need to change our focus from, my, from, from, from our needs to the other person's needs. Just, trust me, when a, when a manager comes out to argue a play with me or whatever call I'm having, I have a hard time changing my focus. But I've got to change my focus. I need to understand what he's saying. All I'm trying to do, I'm not going to change my opinion. I've got, I'm taking the right stand. I'm a man of integrity. I'm going to take the right stand. But I've got to listen to what he has to say. I've got to find a way to change my focus so that I can participate in whatever it is he wants to talk about. So I need to change my focus. I need to shift from my needs to his needs. It's a matter of understanding where that person is coming from. It's understanding their motivation, their temperament, their background, their values, their past hurts. Anybody have dealt with hurt in their lives? Some hurts are, 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 are monumental hurts. And it's taken a long time to get over. It may take a lifetime to get over. Are you still with me? And yet, everybody has hurts. We have a story. How do you learn all those things about another person? I gotta, you've got to talk. You've got to listen. In fact, you need to listen more than you talk. And this isn't easy when you're in a conflict. Because you want to be understood. You want to know, you want to tell that person why you're right. I'm learning, and it's taken me a long time to learn this. I've made a decision. I believe I'm right. This other person doesn't believe it. The coach comes out to argue. I don't know if he just didn't have breakfast that day. I don't know if there's other stresses in his life. I don't know if his job's on the line because he has a losing season. And some of these, in, 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 particularly in the college level, there's a lot of money riding on these games. Win, lose, win and loss records really mean something monetarily to these guys. You know, ask Jay Johnson, who's left to go to LSU, and now we got, fortunately, uh, Chip Hill, you know, doing Arizona baseball. That's good. 
But we're, he's getting paid a lot of money not to lose. You understand what I'm saying? You have to understand the position. I need to listen twice as... You know, God gave us a great example. How many mouths did he give you? How many ears do you have? So don't you think you need to listen twice as, uh, twice as much than you talk? Just use that as, I got two ears, one mouth. Maybe I need to listen twice as much than talking. Just, I'm just saying. Look at this. The Bible talks about this change of focus in Philippians chapter 2. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't think only about your own affairs, but the interest in, uh, be interested in others too. And what they're doing. Your attitude, listen to this, your attitude should be the same that Christ, Je that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling his rights as God. Think about that. God was more interested in you than his own needs. God was more interested in your sin and how he's going to re remedy this sin than, than his own comfort. Understand this. God loved you so much. Though you were a sinner, he still came and died for your sins. How do you reconcile that with stress? All of a sudden, I'm blown away. I don't know about you, I am blown away. I'm totally blown away. And I'm a little disappointed sometimes in myself for trying to always try to be right rather than living right. Does that make sense? You know, what you can... You, you, you can try to be right, but not live the right way. Does that make, you see where I'm, where I'm going with that? My time is, is limited this morning. And I, I'm just going to put this on pause this morning, because there's more to this passage that I want to get to in Ephesians. But I am, I am just t totally, totally just blown away with the love of God. You know what? God is, is ultimately righteous, holy and righteous, right? And we deserve whatever we get. And instead, he took our punishment for him. He took his, our punishment on himself. He came in flesh, in, 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 he, he took on life, the fleshly life, lived a sinless life, sacrificed himself for us. And we have the audacity to stand before people and argue about things that doesn't have anything to do with eternity. And sometimes I'm ashamed that I got caught up in something like that. I'm sometimes ashamed that I'm sitting there frustrated about my computer, not realizing that God has divine appointments for me in my life. Did you realize that? God has divine appointments for me in my life. God has a divine appointment for you in your life. Circumstances create all kinds of conflicts, create all kinds of things. And there's more I want to say about this. But I just want to put a pause, hit the pause button. We'll come back to this next week. But, um, Mike, I'm going to share our encounter. Is that all right with you? There's a young man sitting over here. His name's Mike, and I'm going to get his name Kasarian. Mike Kasarian. Am I even close? It's Armenian. I'm, I'm not even close. That's okay. He will tell you what his last name is, because I've got it written out in here. I'm frustrated. I am frustrated beyond... I can't tell you how frustrated. frustrated. I've got a great computer. I have lots of RAM. I have... It's, a, it's got a fast processor. I got a, like a quad processor. We spent a lot of money. The church spent a lot of money on this computer. And just to have Microsoft just, you know, all of a sudden my stress level has just gone up just now. Just saying the word Microsoft. <laughs> <sighs> it, 
If that computer was working, my, my work would have been done probably about 10 and 10 and 11 o'clock that morning on Thursday because uh, I worked a little bit even though Gina and I uh, was we were together on Monday Tuesday Wednesday I had grandbabies coming over on Thursday I had to make sure I got my work done so I could see my grandbabies but I couldn't I had to be in the office and a young man called me Mike and he says I uh, I need to talk to somebody and beknownst to Mike, I'm rolling my eyes going, I, I don't have time for this. I mean, I, that, and I mean no offense to Mike, he knows, we've, we've had this conversation. And there was something inside of me says, okay, I'm here, he's here, he came over, I stopped what I was doing. We, we were together, what, two and a half hours. Mike says he was tired living the way he was living. Something needed to be done in his life. He didn't know what it was per se, but he just knew that there was something different. And I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth. And we had a divine appointment. God had set an agenda and a schedule for both of us. I was there, he was there. And Mike said, you know, I've got to change the way I'm living. I'm not... This is not working for me. And I shared with him that Jesus loved him. That he died for his sins. And that he could have this new life that I had. And, if you, and you can have that new life that we now have. Because we prayed, he prayed, and asked Jesus to come into his heart. And if I was not there... God would have arranged a different appointment for Mike, because God's hand was, is upon Mike. But I feel so... What's the word I'm looking for? Ashamed. That I wasn't looking for a divine appointment in my life. And then I felt so relieved. And the stress just... The stress on my computer, everything just kind of melted away. Because I realized what God had done in our lives. And Mike is here today, and I'm going to be presenting him a little bit later in the services. But if you're watching at home, this is a divine appointment for you too. Right now, this is our divine appointment. You can lower your stress level simply by asking Jesus to come into your life. And if you've already done that, and if you're at home and you've already done that, but your stress level is still up there, then you need to start changing the way God wants you to live because that's not what God wants you, how you want, He wants you to live. He wants to give you an abundant life. There will be stresses. The things, things happen in life. I was reading a, a story in the Baptist press about a young family in First Baptist Church, Terry, Mississippi. And I'm not saying, telling you anything in private because it's out there in Baptist press. This young family has three children, a, a six-year-old son, a four-year-old son, and a two-year-old daughter. And the pastor is in, was doing a sermon series on, on um, uh, um, uh, pain and suffering sorrows why God allows sorrows into our lives. In the middle of that sermon series, his six-year-old son was diagnosed with glioblastoma, a brain cancer. On July 7th, he left the hospital to go home to hospice care, where barring a, a miracle from God, uh, little Rankin will be leaving his brothers and sisters and his parents and spend eternity with Jesus. And how do you do that? How do you live with that? You live with that because you know this is not it. This is not it. And if this is it for you, I'm so sorry, but you can change that. God has provided you an opportunity to reach out with his arm of grace. All you have to do is reach back with your arm of faith and, and guess what? That transference of righteousness and justification 
flows to you. And you can become a child of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, right now, lower our stress level in such a way that we feel your presence, that we feel your, your draw. You're here with us now. Father, you can change our lives if we will only allow you to do so. Father, I, in my life, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I declare you to be, uh, to be Lord and Master, CEO, boss of my life. Forgive me where sometimes I try to take the reins. Forgive me where I sometimes think that I'm still in charge of my life when I know I'm not. But make your presence feel, feel real. Let your Holy Spirit envelop us. And Father, let there be change in our lives today. And certainly give us clear thinking. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a, we're going to sing a song called uh, Come Just As You Are. It's an invitation. Just go ahead and stand right where you're at. It's an invitation or song of commitment. The altar is open. I'll be up here. If somebody comes forward, that's okay. I will, the ladies can sing. The instrumentalists know what they're doing. If they're not, they'll make it up as we go along anyway. We can do this. And then afterwards, I want to present to you Mike. Mike is going to come, and, and I'm going to just let you meet him a little bit. But, um, but would you come, and would you make that commitment this morning?